and we're on. Hello, everybody. Today is going to be very interesting. When we put out the call the, to ask people what they wanted to, to hear about in these Facebook Lives, we got so many responses asking to talk about trauma and PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. So I, I can only assume, we can only assume that it is because of the current situation that it is right now. It's not like trauma hasn't existed before, obviously, but there's a lot of uh, stress and, and possibly trauma happening in the communities uh, across the world right now with the COVID situation. And um, I imagine it's because of the fear that that is generating that um, there's so much interest in trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder. However, I have to say a qualifier there is that in the last uh, three to four years, I have noticed a little bit of a fashion being formed in the mental health sphere in which people, um, some people almost would, would want, it's not a very good word, but they seem to seek out this idea that they're possibly their personal problems is because they have experienced trauma. It's not because they, and, and it, maybe they can't do anything about it. It's completely wrong to think that way. It is not beneficial, it's not a building, but we will talk a little bit more about all these things as we go. Now, what I would like to do myself and, and Amy, by the way, my name is Peter Diaz. If you haven't met me before, I'm the CEO of the Workplace Mental Health Institute and my colleague, Amy Golding, uh, she's the Director of Psychology for the Institute. And um, I have Hi, a everyone. question for you. Hello. I, I have a question for you. Uh, is there anyone out there right now that is in lockdown or quarantine? And if so, what is it like? I mean, what level is it at? Of course, the lockdown, the quarantine is quarantine. So if you can put that in the comments as we talk, that would be fantastic. Um, there's, there's something else. Uh, I wanted to ask you is, is this something in particular around trauma, PTSD, grief and loss that you want us to talk about today or something that you want to know, a question that you've had wanted to ask that you don't have an answer to. So any of that stuff, remember, are you in lockdown, quarantine, or is it something that you want to know today? We'd love to have those comments and um, deal with them as they come in. So welcome, very nice to see you. So let's get ready, let's jump straight into it. And we're gonna do an overview of trauma and PTSD and who else, who better to do that than our in-house psychologist, Emmy Golding. Oh, thank you. So uh, starting off with a little bit of a, a definition around trauma and what we're actually talking about, because as, as Peter said, this word has been used, like a lot of mental health terms, it's been used a lot these days in a broad range of scenarios. So if we go back to the, the basics, trauma is actually Greek for wound. So it was originally referring to the actual physical injury that people experience, but now of course we refer to it in the sense of emotional uh, trauma as well. So it's been described as a deeply distressing or disturbing experience, that's sort of one definition. But that sort of suggests that the event itself is the trauma. And, you know, we've, we've moved a little bit beyond that now to actually referring to it as the psychological or emotional response to that distressing or disturbing experience. So that's kind of interesting because it says the, exist, the existence of that event itself is not the trauma, it's how we react to it and how we respond, which is, is a little bit different. Um, we've also got the definition that it's uh, feeling out of control. So going through a frightening experience that disconnects us from our sense of safety. Uh, so this sort of taps into the idea that we, when our safety is threatened, either physical safety or our sense of self and who we are as a person. And when we go through an experience that we feel like we may not even survive it, that's kind of one of the criteria for some to have experienced a, a traumatic situation. So we've kind of got this idea that you could say trauma is in the eye of the beholder. You know, so what one person experiences as traumatic may be different to someone else. And we see that, you know, the common example is for two people in a car accident. For one person, their life flashed before their eyes and hey, they really had that deep fear that something very, very bad was going to happen. Whereas for someone else, it might be in exactly the same car, but for them, it was just a minor prank. Um, we've had insurance, everybody was okay. 
they're less likely to perceive that as a traumatic experience and less likely to have a trauma response to it. So we've got to be really, really careful not to assume when it comes to trauma. And so for that reason, we talk about the language we use is potentially traumatic events. So when we're talking about things like accidents and assaults, natural disasters, and it can also be ongoing experiences that people have like bullying, for example. So while some people may find that very difficult, other people might, you know, for a natural disaster, for example, other people might not to go on to develop any sort of mental health issue in response to that. In fact, the research is showing that most of us will at some point in our life go through some kind of potentially traumatic experience, up to 75% of people, but only 5 to 10% of those will actually go on to have a traumatic response. So that's, that's very encouraging. And, and of course, even those people who have a traumatic response, the majority recover within the first 12 months and others after that too. So some very important points there, you know, nobody, no one experiences trauma in the same way. Um, but the truth is a trauma uh, as such, it's only impacting a, a minimal percentage of the population. And that's why we need to be very careful when something happens that we don't use a language like, oh my God, that, could, that must have been so traumatic because it doesn't have to. In 95% of cases or more, uh, people do not experience trauma. Now, it wasn't fun. It was still a negative event. They may have been scared. They may have had negative emotions. They may have cried, but it didn't linger on as a traumatic event or a traumatic response in their lives. And of course, that's relevant for COVID this year. Sure, there are a lot of people in different type of COVID. I mean, um, Thank you, Matt, for that, that response. Uh, he said in Sydney, um, you are in, you've had a pretty good compared to other parts of the world. And I hope it continues like that for you guys, that that would be really nice. And um, even, even in places where the lockdown has been severe, like Madrid, not everyone has experienced it the, the, the same way. Sometimes because of the environment was different. I mean, if you have a family of seven in a small apartment, that is 60 square meters. And that is the reality for a lot of people in big cities like Madrid or Barcelona. Uh, that is a very different experience to a family of four in a independent home with four or five bedrooms and a yard where they can go outside. So sometimes the physical environment makes a, a distinction. Sometimes the internal environment makes a distinction. So how is the lockdown being experienced? So it is important that we don't judge people through our own lens, but that we try to understand the person's experience through their eyes, their history, their situation. And it, it is not a sign of weakness. Uh, I, I think it's, I like to call it more a sign of, of processing. Sometimes people are trying to process the new information that is coming into their lives, the new sense of threat that is coming into their life. They're trying to process the fear response and how to work that through in their lives. Trauma can stay with you for a long time, but it can also stay with you for a very short time. And uh, if you do, if you take certain steps and allow that process of transformation to take place. I'm not gonna say that it's a fantastic process, but it is a natural process. Um, it is a natural process. Accepting trauma is exacerbated, it's, it's magnified, and uh, the person can get caught to, uh, in it. So uh, right. I'm so glad that so many people are learning about trauma. So we can all help with our language and with our attitude. We don't want to be positive, but we will show you what to do. You know? uh, we don't want to be negative either. So how can we show up for people? So definitely in a traumatic, pot potentially traumatic event, an incident where trauma for some people could develop, uh, they do feel a sense of threat um, they also feel that their identity is shaken and possibly they feel that they don't matter. And this is one of the, my, my pet peeves at the moment uh, with some of the language around COVID is where some workers have been deemed non-essential. I, I think that's a terrible title, don't you? You're, you're, you're a non-essential worker. I mean, we know what they're trying to get at. We need people to run around even in a, in a, in a, in a, in a in a tight lockdown, uh, 
and we need other people that can stay home and and they should stay home to protect other people so but just just be, uh, be aware that the uh, uh, sense of identity is being challenged and of course even more if you are told to stay home and don't work and possibly like has happened for millions of people that you've lost a job now you've become unemployed that's that's severely an identity shift so the more severe the identity shift in that traumatic potentially traumatic situation the more uh, difficult it's going to be for that person to shift their identity quickly the faster they shift the identity the faster the trauma could potentially be over but identity is is tight is, is very very um tied to to what's going on now there's also distressing and disturbing situations that could cause trauma like conflict and we have seen <laughs> we are experiencing some of the conflict aren't we some of us believe we shouldn't wear masks some of us believe we should wear masks and there's a lot of there's a lot of opinions and fights and sometimes we even forget that we are friends you know we are friends and we act as if we were enemies we're not enemies we're still friends but we can have different opinions but it doesn't look like it right so we've got to be very careful that as we are entering conflict we keep reassuring people that it's okay to have different opinions that we still love each other and it, it is putting under relationships under pressure no end and and the other one that can cause the, the that adds to the potentiality of a trauma of a traumatic event becoming traumatic for the person is whether the person has got some kind of control as to in their life right i may not be able to control what's happened to my car in the accident but uh i was in control of of, of something else i don't know i i, Wearing I, a seat belt. I had everything <laughs> like yeah i had the seat belt. i was wearing the seat belt i had bought a car that had uh, airbags so i had some kind of control and also i had the speed dial on my phone and i could call the ambulance very quickly if somebody was injured so i could be somewhat in control and if i feel in control that helps my chances of moving faster through the trauma process if there is going to be one mm -hmm. right absolutely critical so remember, all of these responses are, are completely okay. So one of the another principle in psychology when it comes to trauma is that, you know, just as the body does what it needs to do to heal itself, you know, if we cut our skin, you know, the skin will repair itself, put a bandaid on and let it heal. We believe that mentally, the mind sort of does what it needs to do as well. So if we look at the three main symptoms for post traumatic stress disorder, you see the first one being that sort of being hypervigilant, they call it. So being extra alert and jumpy and on edge. And that sort of makes sense, right? If you've been through a, a, a difficult situation or there was a danger, you want to be extra alert for future dangers so you can respond effectively and appropriately. So that makes sense. The second symptom is uh, emotional numbness. So a lot of people describe, well, you know, I just don't feel connected to life. There's something, I just feel kind of numb. I'm not feeling bad, but I'm not feeling the joys of life either. I'm sort of just existing and, and not living. So again, that can protect us from future hurt. If I get too emotionally invested in something, I might get emotionally hurt. So better, and it's not that it's a conscious process, but unconsciously that seems to be what the mind does to cope. And then the third main symptom of PTSD is re-experiencing the event. So that might be having flashbacks or nightmares. And similar to hypervigilance, that can be the mind just sort of processing what it needs to. So I know I've definitely spoken with a lot of people who said they've had some really interesting dreams <laughs> in the last few months as well. Again, we, we don't fully understand how the mind works, but we believe that that's some sort of processing. So we say that all of these responses are a normal response to an abnormal situation. And, you know, this, I can't think of any time that's been more abnormal than 2020. So a Absolutely. normal response to an abnormal situation. Yes. And that's something that goes for grief and loss as well. It's not just trauma, it's also grief and loss. Yes. And, and we have to remember it is a natural psychological process when we're moved out of uh, what we're com where what we're used to even if we're not comfortable if we have moved out of a situation that we used to and we're put into another one there is a push 
and a pull within ourselves to go back to what we were in considered normal, which was normal. So that we, we're experiencing that. So now that's something that goes for grief and loss too. So trauma, grief and loss, it goes all together. It, they're responses to a shift in identity. To what identity? We don't know. If we knew, we wouldn't have trauma. If we knew, we wouldn't have grief and loss because we would see immediately, I may lose something here, but I'm gonna get something else over here. And, but it is a psychological process and it's an emotional process. It's called an existential inquiry. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great sounding name, isn't it? It makes, makes us sound intelligent. It only means that I'm asking myself, why am I here? Who am I? Um, what's my purpose in life? It, I thought I was passionate about this, but now life seems to say, you're not. <laughs> this is not exactly where you should be. It was fine while you were here for a while, but now you need to go in this other path. The problem is life tells you this is not the path for you, but it doesn't tell you very clearly which one is. So that's where the difficulty is. Who am I really? What am I here for? What is the meaning of my life? Does it even have any meaning? Uh, what is really important to me? I thought going to work was important. Now they send me home. Should I stay home? Is being with the family important? Well, it's for me, but now I hear that some families where there is abuse, there is dysfunction, children are getting hurt. That doesn't sound like a good idea, but my experience is a good idea. So what is, what does, what does it all mean? How do I get some balance and harmony in my life? And how can I share that balance and harmony with others? Because any identity that is fully formed will move from a narcissistic approach to a more altruistic approach in every single case. Because as we become older and more mature, we also become more able to see in different layers. So this is impacting in this area of life, but where else is it impacting? And how can I be of service in other areas? That doesn't mean you become a superhero. We can't be everything to everyone. We're not Superman. But it does mean that as we, as we grow, as we grow older, we do expand to help other people. And this could not be achieved, by the way, without this existential inquiry that makes us sometimes feel threatened and it pushes some of us into trauma. And also almost everyone pushes almost everyone into grief and loss, even if we experience it differently. I'm sure that a lot of people, we have cried many times over what's going on in the world right now, right? And maybe not just with COVID, maybe we have cried because because of how the world is being polluted and we don't want to see it that way. We have cried because of how many animals are, are disappearing or being extinct. Who knows? There's, there's so many things that we could focus on, but it is an existential inquiry. It is a call to action. How are you going to show up for the world from today on? And, and I think Peter, it's, it's also in, when we're in these situations, we're reminded that we may not be around forever or things can change really, really quickly. So am I doing all the things that I want to do with my life? Yeah. And they're, they're yeah. great questions for people to ask, um, but it can be difficult to face those questions as well. Um, so it's really important that people get assistance with that if they need it. Right. Yeah. The other thing to remember, uh, we're talking to the privilege in, in a sense, the privileged, class of humanity we are we are we have we have everything we want um, even even some of the poorest among us sometimes have a, a lot more than the poor in third world countries so in a sense we're we're spoiled we're emotionally psychologically and physically spoiled can you agree with that most of us most of us i'm not saying everybody i'm not saying everybody i know some people are saying not everybody i agree not everybody, but most of us are spoiled. So what happens with spoiled people when things don't go our way? We feel it, don't we? We chuck a tantrum. We don't like it. So that's grief and loss. That, that can precipitate us into a traumatic event. But it is not necessarily an unnatural thing. It is a natural process. 
So if we learn the techniques to go through it as quickly as possible, we will save ourselves some suffering and we can help other people through that as well. Take it away. So how do we support people who have experienced trauma then? This is one of the big questions that came in. And in particular, how do we manage psychological safety in the workplace for people that we know have experienced a trauma in their past? So we're going to run through eight principles uh, of, uh, in, in response to that. How do we manage psychological safety and how do we support people who've experienced trauma? And the first one is be trauma informed, which is sort of what you're doing here today being aware that people have been through all sorts of things that you may not know about. And most people don't introduce themselves and immediately tell you all about the traumatic events in their life. Um, but, you know, we can safely assume that there'll be a certain proportion of people who have been through a potentially traumatic event, some who will have struggled with it at some point. Now, you don't need to know all about that situation, all the nitty gritty details in order to create psychological safety but being trauma informed is about being aware. So there may be some clues. Um, for example, in a workplace, you might see someone overreacting to things or what seems like an overreaction to you if you don't know how, what's going on for them. Um, for example, a really common one might be if someone really struggles to receive feedback, it can be presented in the best possible way, but they can still feel it as criticism. We know that that one's a very common for people who've been through some sort of a traumatic event in the past. So, you know, don't assume, just keep it in mind. It might not be about you, their reaction, um, but just, you know, if you see those sorts of scenarios, you can go, oh, I remember what they were saying about trauma. There might be something going on here. I don't need to ask about it, but that awareness helps you respond better. The second point is avoid re-traumatization, which means avoid things that are going to make the trauma worse or make it come back in a sense. Uh, if it is work related, you can make sure that there are safety measures in place so it doesn't happen again, but don't be too uptight about things. We know from psychology that one of the best therapies we have for trauma is gradual exposure to, to things. So we're not as, as sensitive to it, but don't do it by yourself, do it with expert help. Now, we want to make sure that we're physically and psychologically safe. Physical measures are usually pretty clear. You just avoid certain things. Psychological things sometimes are not as clear. Uh, in a, in, it may be uh, things that we need to be brutally honest with ourselves and say, when I do this activity, even though I like it, that is not actually good for me. I'll give you an example that is an easy one. So. If a person, not, not you, but if a person is feeling very scared with the, with the current situation that we have around COVID, one of the things that is simple that they may not like doing is to actually not watch the news for a couple of days, right? Very simple, but they might not look like, the, they might not like it. Because sometimes it's weird, but psychologically, and this happens to all of us, it's almost like an addiction. We are attracted to a little bit of pain, a little bit of drama, and we seek it out. Mm -hmm. And when we cut it off, it's like something is missing. It's almost like being addicted to alcohol or, or drugs. You know it's not good for you, but when you, if you stop it, what happens? You get a craving for it, don't you? So the same thing at the psychological level, we can become addicted to bad news or things that are not actually, are actually toxic for us. That's why it's so hard to leave toxic relationships because we're addicted to the toxicity. It's not our fault, it's a perfectly natural response. It's about being aware that this happens and being a little bit more disciplined and saying, no, I'm gonna stop it. What's so the, the third, third one, one is trust and transparency. So this is kind of related to that psychological safety. So in a workplace particularly, do what you say you do, do what you say you will, be honest, be clear. So for a lot of people who've experienced something traumatic, it's inter an interpersonal trauma related to people. So you wanna create a space where people can trust each other. Don't surprise people, provide information make sure they know what's happening and when and why as much as you can. Obviously there's going to be different scenarios that come up, but this principle of being transparent so that people can trust you 
will go a long way to creating a psychologically safe working environment. Great. So the fourth, the fourth one is provide dignity and choice. And this is, remember that one of the principal elements for trauma to happen is for the person to feel helpless, that they have no control over the situation. So you want at work, you want certain policies and practices which respect people's autonomy and respect their ability to make informed decisions. And this is one of the problems that we've had with this COVID situation around the world is that many, many governments have not trusted their citizens. They are not treating their citizens as fully grown adults that can be trusted. And they treat them as children. I've got news for them. At the psychological level, grown-ups don't like to be treated like children. And if you do, they will not like you. And they will develop stuff around mental health if they take it inward. And if they can't take it, if they don't take it inwards, they will lash out somehow. This is wrong. And we, as, at a psychological level, we need to trust people with honor, dignity, and respect. And, and that provides them the, the aspect, the, the, not the aspect, the, the environment where they can take agency. They, are, they can take agency, responsibility for their decisions. And that's, that's very important. Now, I understand that that's not, when you're in a crisis, people are gonna have the first response, which is gonna be, while well, we make a, we'll make, while well, we make decisions as to what this means, we need, we need to take a uh, very drastic action. That, that's normal. But uh, if, if, we, if that lack of respect continues for a long time, it can be very damaging at the psychological level, individual psychological level, and also the collective psychology. You know, it's, there's two kinds of psychology, the individual and the collective. And this is what we're seeing sometimes when people are not playing along, is because they feel disrespected and they're out of control. Yeah. So that's let, so let's true. And even at the situation. individual level, um, you yeah. know, even just one on one with another person, uh, it can be very tempting if you're a caring person and a loving person to want to kind of look after people and say, "Oh, they're there. That's you true. poor thing. Um, you know, that must have been so difficult." And and sometimes that can come across as condescending for people. So we've got to be really careful to get that balance right, expressing empathy and reassurance, but also treating people as capable and strong adults, which they are, um, so that we don't create a, a victim mentality. So that balance yeah. is something that you'll need to, to, again, work out case by case, but just keep that in mind. Just because someone's been through something difficult doesn't mean that they're, they're weak or less than or that you should treat them as a child. They're still strong adults and we want to encourage people to tap into that part of themselves too and we we know this is a basic psychological uh, principle if you treat people as stupid they will behave stupid and if you treat people as kids they will behave like kids and guess what do kids do you know they they, they run amok so uh, it's it's a basic these are basic proven psychological principles. We've got study after study that have shown uh, this, but we don't have the time to go into it. Uh, maybe that'll be, we can talk about it in another live later. So the next one is managing triggers, which is a very interesting one. Um, there's been a lot of talk about this in recent years. And the challenge is you can't protect people against all triggers because first of all, you may not be aware what they are. And they can also be very, very specific to the individuals. It could be something like a particular word that has a special a meaning for them and that might be unavoidable. So, you know, what we normally try and address um, triggers by including trigger warnings before events, for example. So you've heard, all heard them, you know, this topic might be sensitive. Um, and sometimes that can be a very genuine concern. Sometimes it can be about people, you know, making sure that they're not liable. <laughs> But uh, the research seems to be in now that many times uh, trigger warnings can actually make the situation worse. This is coming from a Harvard study that was done. And, and this is because of the, the power of language. It's think about the reverse of the placebo effect. So if you tell someone that this is gonna be really, really difficult and stressful, then it's more likely to be difficult and stressful. So I give the example of, you know, when you go to the doctor, 
and you have to have some sort of procedure or maybe an injection or something. You want some warning, but you don't want the doctor to say, oh, this is going to be excruciating. <laughs> they, so you wouldn't go back to that doctor ever again. They say, look, this might be a little bit uncomfortable, but it'll be over in a second. So they give you some warning, but they also let you know it's going to be okay. And you see the same thing on airlines for those of you who remember what it was like to catch a plane, you would say in, in the unlikely event of an emergency. So this is kind of the approach that we want when it comes to triggers. Um, notice that it's kind of broad. It's, it doesn't say what that emergency is. It just says, look, if, if stuff comes up, that's okay, here's what we do. So there's a plan of action for that as well. So that again, allows the person to feel empowered that they have um, the opportunity to look after themselves. Because there is a mutual responsibility here in, in workplaces. It's, you know, we do everything we can to create good environments for people, but the person themselves has a responsibility too. So at the end of the day, showing that you care goes a long way and having those honest conversations and talking about what people need. Yeah, the number six is manage the physical space. That's very straightforward. Uh, things that we can think about at work is good lighting, if not even at work. I mean, uh, even in cities, if, if lighting is poor, it has shown that crime uh, increases. Uh, so good lighting, uh, good lighting in the, in the home, uh, clear entrances and exits. Uh, is there enough space for people or are they going to feel claustrophobic? Are there any, um, I'm thinking of mental health, can, can police show up to help people not dressed as police, but they came in plain clothes. Uh, we know that if they show up in plain clothes, the likelihood of um, something escalating into violence is lessened. Um, so that, that's something to take into consideration, right? So, yeah. On the that's individual level, yep. number seven, meet people where they're at. So this is a, a more of an individual level um, principle. Don't tell the person, oh, it's not so bad. Um, or to go back to the current situation, you know, at least you can see your family or at least don't minimize a person's experience, especially if you haven't been through it yourself. And even if you have been through it yourself, you haven't been through it as that person. So respect their experience, try and understand what they're going through. So this two sides to this, don't minimize it, but don't embellish it either. As Peter referred to earlier, that, oh, that's terrible. That's so bad if the person's not feeling that. Um, so really try and put your own judgment aside. Yeah, it, it's, it's hard. I realize it's hard because we, we're such social animals, aren't we? And it's all about emotions sometimes when we interact with people, how we make them feel, how they make us feel. Um, but it is important that if we're going to help people, and I know some of you are interested in what do I do? How do I help people that are experiencing this? Uh, try to be as neutral as possible for their sake. Mm -hmm while still remaining human. So with that, it brings me to point eight. Don't assume what is going to be helpful. Rule number one, rule number one of anyone that wants to help is ask. Three letter word, ask, A-S-K. What do you need to feel safe? Are you feeling safe? That should be the first. How do you feel? <laughs> should be the first one. How do you feel? Uh, I'm fine, okay. If you can believe it, if it's like, I'm fine, but maybe you don't believe it. <laughs> Are you sure? You know, you're not sounding like you're fine. So, but make sure that you do that in a, in a kind way, not in a pushy way, not in a, in a sticky big way, not like in a, in a way that you want to leave them naked. You know, some people just need to know that you're there. They don't need you to be a counselor. Uh, you shouldn't be a counselor anyway, if you want to help people. In a workplace, for example, it might be simple things like how is the desk position in the office? Um, I, I've seen a lot of people that get relaxed with very different things. Uh, it's amazing in um, English countries, how many people get, get back into relax mode with a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, it's wonderful and that's all they need. However, however, that is their experience. It doesn't mean that because I like a cup of tea or like a cup of coffee that makes me relax, that's gonna relax them. So find out, ask, help the process for them. When you're asking, 
It shouldn't be you're asking because you want to know. You, it should be more a helpful questioning that helps them work out things. Because it's not about us, is it? It's about them. So the question should be in, in such a way that they, it helps them. Well, that's the eighth point. And uh, well, let's talk a little bit about how this, uh, we've had a couple of questions. One is, how do we create wellness? So, so we'll be talking about that a little bit. How do we create wellness? There's two aspects to that. How do we create wellness or more than one aspect? Maybe there's more than two. Um, one is how do we create wellness for ourselves? Then there's another one is how do we create wellness for others? One of the, one of the key things that we can do in order to create wellness for ourselves and others is not necessarily think positively, although that's helpful, um, but make sure that we don't, we don't create negative. I'll give you an example by that, what I mean by that, by creating negative. It means that you may have a negative thought, stop the process of articulating and expressing the negative thought. That's the first step. So don't worry about being positive, just don't create negative. Don't let it become form in the physical world. That sounds a bit esoteric, doesn't it? But, but you know what I'm getting at, eh? Don't, don't let it come out of your lips. If, if we win that battle, we are winning a big battle in creating wellness for ourselves. Because remember, I don't know if I've told you this before, but your brain is listening to whatever you say. When it hears something that you said, he says, got it, that's what we're gonna do. The, the brain is not there to help you out in anything except in achieving what you have created, what your, what your intention is. That's basic psychology, right? Your, your brain is there to help you that way. So remember that, wellness for yourself, don't let it come out. Wellness for others, don't let it come out. <laughs> you know, That's a basic one too. So that's something that we can do. So, so one of the other questions the that's come in, yes, is around yes. the impact of lockdown for well-being. Uh, and I think we've covered some of these already, but uh, just to go through some of the key impacts, obviously some people are having a trauma response, um, which may appear to others to be overreacting or paranoid, but it does make sense when you understand what's going on uh, with people's lives being impacted in such an extreme way. So um, fear is appropriate, anger is appropriate. These are all sort of normal trauma responses. Um, others may go more down the grief and loss side. So loss of job, loss of family members, uh, loss of certainty, loss of control. And that can all sort of change the beliefs that we have about the world and how things work in the world. Um, so sadness, anger, blaming. Um, and ultimately, we aim to have some kind of acceptance of the situation. And that doesn't necessarily mean resignation or that we approve of it, but it's a sense of clarity as to, well, this is what the situation is that we're dealing with. Now, what do I do with that? How do I move forward? Um, so it's all well and good to kind of say, look on the positive side of things, let's be strong and let's be resilient. And we, I'm sure we can all ourselves do that. Some days we wake up and say, right, I'm gonna go for it and I'm gonna make the most of things. Um, but for another person, they might not be having one of those days. They may be having a different day where they're not feeling so great. And so we've gotta be really careful not to dismiss um, other people's experience of the situation. Other impact, I remember, negative impacts. Yeah, go on. Yeah. I remember a few years back, there's, there's, there's some studies that have shown that uh, depressed people are generally more realistic than non-depressed people. It, does, it doesn't mean that it serves them, but um, they do seem to be more in touch with what is really going on. So if somebody comes along and says, oh, but you know, isn't it wonderful that we have all this time now you're completely not creating any rapport. That's not very helpful because the person is saying, hang on, am, am I going crazy here? Uh, am, I, am I the only one that can see this? And, and that can be quite frustrating for people. Mm. Mm. So we're also, another impact of lockdown for well-being is the strained relationships that we've mentioned, whether that's um, family and domestic violence, whether that's conflict with friends, um, some of us just need more space. And if you're in a lockdown and you don't have the space to yourself, that can be very difficult. 
um, especially if you're already under stress and pressure, things, you know, juggling work, homeschooling kids, financial pressures, even, the, you know, busier days with more cooking and cleaning when you're in a lockdown situation. Um, all of those things add just add extra layers of stress and it can build up. And then you couple that with the fact that you don't have the usual coping mechanisms that you may have available. So for someone whose usual way of dealing with stress is to go to uh, and have a heavy workout at the gym with the weights, but they can't do that right now. Or, you know, mo if, you, if you're not able to walk, I know some lockdowns you can, some you can't, but maybe it's go for a swim at the pool and get in the water if that's not available or a personal hobby, whatever that was. So if these were the things that people relied on and now you can't do it, what, what coping mechanisms do you have left? Um, thinking about different demographics, you might have single people who don't have um, that social contact with people or the physical contact right there in, in the house with them. Um, older people, for example, you know, might have their routines that normally involve going out to you know, get my hair done once a week or to buy the paper at the shops. You've also then got the physical impacts of, you know, less fresh air, less sunshine, all those things that we know are good for, for well-being may not be so readily available. So we've really got to work to find other coping mechanisms in these scenarios. And of yeah. course, at the extreme hey. end, it can become so much that people get to, to really thinking about what's the point. And we're going to talk a little bit about that pointy end of the scale in another in another live coming up, but uh, it is a place that unfortunately some people get to. Yeah, the, the other thing is, I was thinking about is this uh, um, area of, of personal space. You know, one of the things that we've noticed around the world is in countries where people don't, don't have a need to touch or be close to other people as much, have done better with COVID because the whole two meter distancing is not that hard for them <laughs> it's kind of like they were doing it already <laughs> so they don't come in close contact so often but in countries where hugs and touch and physical ex you know facial expression and and gestures are so important uh not to be able to hug and touch it's it's a, a little bit of a, a murder of your own soul you know, it's like it, something is missing and can precipitate into, especially all people that are on death's door. Um, you know, we've, we've seen a really sad, sad things happening there, mm. dying, you know, spending the last months of their lives um, isolated and not able to hug mm. and touch and say goodbye to their family members. It's, it's um, a torture. So it's about being able to to empathize with the situation i don't know what the solution is uh, because we haven't spent time thinking about what the alternative solution is but there's definitely a need in that area so and this now, kind of I relates to the last question which was the impact of extended periods of working from home and that disconnection so these are actually two different things working from home in and of itself is not so bad for some people um, whereas others will prefer the office. Some people love so we've it. Seen, Some people are loving it. Yeah, exactly. And, and we've seen a lot of um, discussions coming up uh, around, you know, many people saying, oh, I really like this way of working. And that's fine. It's, for workplaces, it's just about recognizing that we're diverse and your workforce is going to have diverse personalities and people with different preferences and needs. So it's a good thing to create systems that uh, work for everybody. It's not one size fits all. We all work from home or we all must be in in a fixed working environment. Some flexibility where you can is a good thing for well-being generally. Now, obviously there's gonna be constraints and, and restrictions depending on the industry that you're in and the type of work that you're doing, but that principle of flexibility is very, very important. Disconnection on the other hand, that's something that does have an impact. We're social, we're humans are social people. We, even the most introverted people are, still need social contact. So there's a lot of um, philosophers, et cetera, you know, people who've written about the benefits of isolation. And when they've studied this, what the research is showing is that, yes, periods of isolation can be a good thing. But what makes the difference is if it's something that we've chosen to do voluntarily versus if it's forced upon us. Like a fast, as if it was an emotional fasting. Yeah, yeah, it's a good analogy. 
So forced isolation is not beneficial for well-being. And, you know, we see that even in, if you think about prisons and jails, you know, the worst punishment you can get is being sent to isolation. Uh, so yes, it's going to have an impact on people. And I'm you know, particularly concerned about young people um, from little kids who are learning to how to, how to interact with others. So I definitely saw for, for my son, for example, it took him a couple of months after quarantine to get confident to approach other kids in the park. Um, you know, so it had a luckily short-term impact. Um, teens are another group that I think really need their peers at that time in life. Um, so there's that sort of impact. And the, we've already sort of mentioned the emotional isolation as well, um, where people have, you might have differing views from friends and family members about what's going on. And, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of people heavily invested in their own perspective. So lots of conflict, et cetera. And that's a different sense of isolation and feeling like you're the only one who thinks this way. Um, yeah. And I guess that's an important thing to remember that everyone's struggling. <laughs> And, and we've seen we've seen some people react really well to working from home. We have seen pe some people that can't wait to get back to the office. I, I don't get it because I'm the working from home, working from the coffee, working from the beach kind of guy. But, you know, I get it. You know, some people love uh, the office, the structure that it provides. Um, and we've seen some people working from home really burn out because to them psychologically, if they're not in the presence of where the boss is, they feel that they have to keep proving how valuable they are. Um, so Matt is asking a really good question. How do business reinvent uh, with this? And I, and I think from a psychological perspective, there's an absolute need to reinvent the, the, the workplace. I don't think the expectation of, of someone going in 50 hours into a building and staying there with our sunlight in the, uh, with LED lighting and that is natural. That is so unnatural. So how do we reinvent it? How do we, how do we get flexibility? That's a great word. Flexibility is of, of the essence. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that flexibility should not be imposed, should be, should be, should be asked. What do people need and can we work around those needs? Obviously, some people don't have a choice. Some people don't work in an office. A plumber doesn't need, can work from home. Neither does a painter. You know, there's many professions, many, many professions. Those that are considered essential, actually, interestingly, and most of the ones considered essential these days can't work from home. They have to work somewhere else, but those, uh, other professions, the, the more white collar professions, well, we have learned that people don't need to be in an office in order to work anymore. We are so connected. That's part of the problem, by the way. Um, for some people, that's part of the problem. But I think it's wonderful that you don't have to keep, that's my nature, I don't have to keep a nine to five regulation. I don't have to go into a building when I'm told I don't have to get into a bus and which is what, by the way, getting into public transport is probably one of the worst things that you can do for a virus. So why would we do it? You know? Um, so there are really good considerations to be more flexible, to me, be more balanced, to work with people where we can, obviously a nurse, they gotta show up. They can't work from home. Um, maybe they can do something from home. Um, with a new technology, maybe they can, um, but it, it's difficult. So it's about flexibility, isn't it? What's the job like? Uh, can we ask people what's the best way for working? If I had to go into an office, I'll give you an example. If I had to work into an office, the best way for me would be two days in the office, one day at home on Wednesdays, because Wednesday is, is, is hump day and having Wednesday to myself not having to dress up for the office or just dressing up the top bit for the office. It would be fantastic. <laughs> and then I can have Thursday and Friday and then the weekend is there. That would, that would be ideal for but, me. But that really might not be point. ideal it's for everybody. Not, <laughs> it's not all or none. It's, and it's about it's having those discussions yeah. with, your, with your workforce, with your team, get everyone together and brainstorm. What, what are the ideas? What works for you? What works for you? How can we, how can we do this given our industry and our, our environments, you know, what the needs are for the business, 
what the needs are for the team, what the needs are for the individual. Let's have those open, honest discussions about how we want to create things. Start from yeah. a blank slate. If anything was possible, how would we do it? Um, yeah. And go from there. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't see why we need to spend one hour to two hours sitting in a car getting to, to work or being crammed like sardines in public transport being to going to work every single day uh, anymore. The, the, work, the pl life has changed. How we do work has changed. So why not use those to our advantage? Great. So I hope that's some interesting ideas for you today. Some food for thought on a, a bunch of different topics. Um, we might leave it there. Remember, be kind to people. If there was one message that <laughs> to take away from all of this, it's be kind. Everyone's different. Everyone's going through their own journey. Um, so be kind to yourself as well. Uh, next sure. week, we're going to change hope, gears a little bit. Yep, go on. Before you go into that, I just want to remind everybody, look, there's a lot of people suffering out there. Um, obviously, what we've talked about, um, it's a valuable content. Um, if, if you want to share this with them, please do so. We're going to put this video up on, on our YouTube channel, Workplace Mental Health Institute YouTube channel. So you can find it there, you can subscribe, you can share the, the, the links to the video to people that you know. The more people that benefit from it, the better from, from where we stand. And also uh, trauma, trauma, grief and loss that we've talked about have got a common component and that common element in all of them is fear fear in the next two weeks we're going to be producing our next emag uh, online and it's going to be about fear and how fear kills and how we have to be very careful with this so if you haven't signed up for our, our emag we usually send it by mail we put a post on Facebook as well, but if you want to subscribe, go to our website, the WMHI and uh, look for the Emacs section and just subscribe. So you get it because it's going to be really good. You're going to like that. Now you can finish. That's D-T-H-E-W-M-H-I.com. Uh, so next week is going to be all about change and adaptability and flexibility. So I'm building on this conversation as well and the future of well-being moving forward. So Lots of juicy stuff to talk there. Good stuff. About there as well. Thanks for joining. Thanks for watching. We love you all. See ya. <laughs>